for our panel. We'll then move on to international legal affairs and the cha and challenges to the rule of law. Now, this is a this was a long um, and quite complex project in which um, Maria Varaki, Francisco Lobo, Constance Wilhelm, and um, David Bicknell worked together on um, a series of strife um, blog posts <coughs> investigating current challenges to the rule of law in international government, governance, sorry, the use of force, international criminal law, and the tension between civil liberties and security of public health in a pandemic. Maria Varaki is, Dr. Maria Varaki is a lecturer in international law in the War Studies Department with a current research focus on ethics and global justice challenges. She will be introducing the blog series um, and then hand over to Francisco Lobo, who is a doctoral researcher in the Department of War Studies, focusing on international law and military ethics. And Constance Wilhelm, Wilhelm Constance is a doctoral researcher with the Department of War Studies as well at King's College London. Her research interests include feminist security studies and socio-legal methodologies. Her research is on the return and prosecution of European women that joined the Islamic State. So I hope our audience agrees that we have a very illustrious set of ex uh, budding experts and already existing experts. And I will now no longer keep you on tenterhooks and hand over to Rana to introduce the findings of the roundtable and tell us a little bit more about how it started to come together and what she was trying to achieve. Rana, over to you. Thank you, Andrea, for such a warm welcome and for uh, leading our theme this year. It's a pleasure to be joining this panel for the Security Studies Conference, and I'm eager to do the roundtable justice. So as Andrea said, um, on uh, April 29th of this year, the theme held a roundtable on the United States underground and its uncomfortable truths. Um, and this effectively emerged out of a a series of conversations that we held as a theme around this core issue of the US facing considerable threats of isolated political violence based on election and COVID related disinformation. And so taking that issue at hand, we came together to craft a round table to bring together panelists who could speak to um, the various levels and layers of this issue, both from the uh, perspective of um, uh, not just uh, political justice, but then also finding a way to bring in and weave together a narrative around kind of the political movement itself um, and how we can frame conspiracy theories in the context of the United States. And so what I'll do now is just try to kind of recap a lot of the issues that were discussed there. It was held under Chatham House rule. And so I can't name any of our actual panelists and what they said specifically or directly attribute. But what I can do is frame some of these themes and concepts so that when um, I'm joined in a moment by David Bicknell, we can dive even deeper into some of these issues. And so now I'm speaking on behalf of a collective of researchers, which is an honor to do, um, but so I'll be very careful and also kind of brief so that we can offer time for discussion around these issues. Um, so we started, of course, with the, the issue of the diametric interpretations of what happened on January 6th, 2021. Um, in a speech before a joint session of Congress on April 28th, 2021, President Biden described the insurrection on January 6th as an existential crisis and a test of whether or not the United States democracy could survive. But a month prior to that, former President Donald Trump told reporters that although they should not have done it, right from the start, the riot was, quote, zero threat. Um, and so it was clear to us in crafting this roundtable that we needed to take into account that not only is there now a groundswell of federal resources and global attention on what's happening in the United States, but that sustainable solutions to conspiracy theories will be vital when taking into account the democratic, judicial, and socio-cultural interests of the American society writ large. However, this isn't new, and I think our panelists and our researchers in Crafting the Roundtable knew that this issue has been highlighted uh, by various policymakers and experts who, who cautioned against widespread mistrust, disinformation, and conspiracy 
manifestations in person. Um, but what we wanted to make sure to highlight and what I think will be fascinating in this panel and as well to highlight is that in recent years, conspiracists have done so by targeting those that have historically bolster, bolstered civic strength. Um, this includes religious groups, law enforcement and military veterans. And so our unique approach um, was to do so by, uh, to address the issues of conspiracy theories and do so by looking also at issues of, um, of duty, of duty held uh, dear to the military veterans who have been vulnerable to believing conspiracy theories and then um, taking political action um, in pursuit of that or in their belief of the theories that are being spread online. So what I'll do now briefly is just run through a few of the other themes that we discussed. This includes the QAnon movement. I'll talk a bit about disinformation, free speech, um, and touch on domestic terrorism, but all of which is to say, these were themes that were discussed at a round table and which are going to be, I think, um, pursued more deeply and more uh, heavily in detail, either in good research on the topic or even in our own Q&A today. Uh, so just running through very quickly, uh, the QAnon movement, for those who aren't aware, um, is a movement that is spreading across the US and the world, spreading the idea that there is an ongoing mythical battle for the survival of the white race. It embodies a good deal of various conspiracy theories that white supremacy and we'll get into that a little bit further in my conversation with um, with Dr. Bicknell. Um, but what was key in our roundtable was to understand how QAnon is a participatory movement. Um, it's dependent on real users spreading theories, answering questions, doing the research as is often spread as a rallying cry among conspiracy theorists and recruiting others. And that's actually been key to the um, solutions-based responses on behalf of certain social media organizations and law enforcement, uh, which we learned during our roundtable and which is continuing to emerge um, in the news and in the analysis post January 6th today. Um, but as you know, you know, as Americans are searching for answers, there's also this um, new wave of different phenomenon that are coming out, this, this notion of conspiracy convergence, where conspiracies are cross-pollinating and people are being indoctrinated by entering into certain conversation, leaving with other conclusions. And so what we also started to understand is that there is um, a notion of this where, uh, whereby conspiracists are targeting traditional and legitimate parts of society. And that was really fascinating um, thread for us to follow because when city council, school boards, elected sheriffs and local law enforcement positions um, may or may not be held by those who espouse specific conspiracy theories or whether those are baseless um, being up to debate, obviously, but in, in the sense that there are you know, insofar as people debate them in those contexts, there's still something to be said um, for local sheriffs and police members to signal their support for QAnon um, with branded mugs or hand gestures. Um, I'll run quickly through disinformation because I don't want to spend too much time on that. And, and we didn't in the round table as much because it wasn't a panel focused entirely on disinformation as much as it was about the insurrection and um, the role that conspiracy theories played in the events of the Janu of January 6th. Um, and so I'll just say the following, which is I think part of the key that will come up later in my conversation with Dr. Bicknell around fact checking is that those who often try to find solutions to conspiracy theories will often get stuck in a catch-22 where solutions ignite even more conspiracy theories to fan the flames. Um, so for example, when leaders of the Stop the Steal movement were deplatformed, this was seen by many as evidence of an even larger conspiracy theory to silence the movement's leaders. And so that can be a circular issue which results in users being entrenched even further on other platforms. So other platforms to find their voice, to continue to spread the information amongst themselves, um, amongst other real users and to really kind of capitalize on that notion of recruitment. Uh, but I think that what we we didn't get too deep into, which I will say for a bit later, is the the crucial role that fact checking plays in this. Um, but that in particular, fact checking has to be effective. Um, and the ways that it can be effective and not are ones that we got into in the round table insofar as um, fact checking can often only 
uh, touch certain members of the movement, not all. Um, and what that means for its efficacy is, um, is something that I think we'll dive into a little bit deeper. Um, just very quickly on the issue of free speech, uh, during the roundtable and even in the lead up, we, we thought a lot about this in the theme and, and, and in the lead up to the, to the roundtable, is this idea of the protection that the First Amendment offers, but that you know, conspiracy theories when spread as questions can be interpreted as authentic speech. Um, and so there's a, a concern there that when uh, legislating free speech is effectively led to regulators within social media companies, um, what conflicts of interest may or may not exist, but then also uh, to what degree uh, can that responsibility be laid bare on only those companies? How can the federal government play a role? How can state government play a role? And how can local law enforcement play a role? Uh, was something that we were able to discuss and, and develop in, uh, in more detail. But what we were able to identify identify, which I think is crucial and, and might be one of the last few things I say before I wrap on time, um, is that local law enforcement doesn't actually have the ability uh, to monitor the threat intelligence that spreads through conspiracy theories, through the QAnon movement and on the internet in particular, because real users are spreading this information uh, through their personal accounts. And so that spreads an even deeper issue into kind of what is the local law enforcement capacity around this issue. Uh, finally, actually, I, 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 I want to touch a bit on domestic terrorism just before I, I hand it over to Dr. Bicknell. Um, the Biden administration, this happened, I think this, this happened in tandem with, with um, the, the development of this round table in the aftermath of January 6th, we saw a massive federal response um, through a series of measures to, uh, to combat the uh, perceived domestic terrorism and, and, and domestic white nationalism that was spreading in the aftermath of the January 6th insurrection. And so the FBI, the DOD, the Department of Justice, Homeland Security, um, all announced programs and initiatives. But what does that actually mean um, when allocating funds um, isn't met with the right um, measured reactions is something that we discussed and that I think we can get into further with David, uh, with Dr. Bicknell um, in just a moment, kind of how can the actors responsible for disinformation and the spread of deeply rooted conspiracy theories actually be targeted properly by the federal government and are they there are existing tools, for example, the ones used around organized crime um, that we can kind of learn lessons from and implement in this context. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, our roundtable and our research effort as a group within the theme uh, was focused around this idea and this um, prevailing understanding that the conspiracy fueled violence um, is showing an extremely potential real world harm by way of politically motivated violence. Uh, but that before any laws are able to be passed, either them, you know, be them domestic terrorism laws or, or otherwise, um, Americans have to face some uncomfortable truths, hence the title of our roundtable. But, but more to the point, um, certain groups and organizations that uh, profit off of disinformation are making inroads into the federal government. And, and Dr. Bickle and I will talk about that later, but that issue is, has yet to, I think, be widely acknowledged. Um, and until that's done, I think we'll create more problems than we anticipate. Um, and so did the panelists at our roundtable and our attendees as well. And so I will hand over now to Dr. Bicknell to take us even further into how some more objective analysis into what we discussed in the roundtable um, can potentially shed light on um, other through lines in other countries and other regions um, and, and even historically as well. Thank you, Rana. I feel a little bit of an interloper here because Rana arranged and hosted the, the round table. And as you've just heard, summed up really what was an hour and a half or more's dense discussion in a few minutes. And my role has really been to be part discussant and part interviewer to try and bring out a few themes um, that Rana brought up there and to give an external view, an external meaning I wasn't part of the round table, although I managed to join it for part of it to uh, view it as everybody else could. And then partly to take a perspective outside of the United States, as you've heard, it's very much focused on the United States. What I was trying to do was bring together an idea which is 
probably very important to um, a lot of the audience who are PhD uh, researchers is how do we transfer research from a very focused idea of the United States to a more broader um, context. My particular area of study has been the UK historically and as a matter of law. And so I am not a, an expert on a lot of these things or any of the things that Sarana is talking about. So we divided the, the themes that I drew out of it into three. One was baseless conspiracy theories. Second was white supremacy. And the third, if we have time for it, was democratic representation. I'm not sure we will so that we have enough time for questions from the audience. And the first one, which I've termed baseless conspiracy theories, which was a phrase that came up in the conference, really had two strands. One was that it had the idea that there were conspiracy theories such as Pizzagate, where Hillary Clinton was accused of being part of a paedophile ring operating out, operating out of a pizza restaurant in New York, or the QAnon type um, conspiracy theories that puts President Biden a devout Catholic as some sort of Satanist and saying these are baseless in that you can fact check them and find they're not true, but yet people are resistant to that. So is this in some way a difference between misinformation, getting the wrong story, or disinformation where there's a deliberate intent to mislead? And the second part of that is that we need to do something about it, that the conspiracists who were at um, the Capitol on the 6th of January, in what I'm going to call public disorder, to avoid applying at this stage a, a label Rana referred earlier to a riot, and in the panel it was called insurrection, um, and that those will be accountable before the law, um, when the investigations are complete, for criminal offences, such as offences against the person and against property, and that will take its course. But the, beyond that criminal sanction, there's really something that ought to be happening here. So the first sort of question to try and bring those together was what, if anything, should be done about the conspiracy theories and the conspiracists below this level of criminality? And I think it's one that we began to tease out. It's a really good one around um, the difference between distorted facts and distorted beliefs. Um, and in particular, this notion of um, distorted beliefs requiring more uh, geographic, uh, political and strategic, convert more of a convergence of those elements in order to manifest um, a, a belief system around a conspiracy theory, um, rather than a singular fact being distorted and that being addressed. But one issue, um, or sorry, one solution rather that was posed during our round table, I should say, um, was a vaccine for disinformation, which was really a bit more of an interesting approach to kind of how do you get to the heart of the issue of baseless conspiracy theories, as you so rightly pointed out, David, it's, it's, um, it's for, in this context about strengthening the fabric of the nation. Um, and the suggestion I believe was around a wide ranging public service campaign where um, you know, common values are pitted against a common enemy uh, because it is getting circular, the, the logic around solutions for baseless conspiracy theories because whether it's posed as a question or authentic speech or spread by real users, um, there are various concerns here that local law enforcement and state and federal law enforcement are facing uh, when trying to, to get a handle on how to address it, as you very rightly pointed out, um, whatever it's called or however it's been referred to, and it's been referred to by many, many different terms in, in, all, in all sorts of um, news agencies, the, the folks that need to be held accountable are being held accountable um, insofar as the FBI has been arresting um, the participants, but to what degree can you actually address that root issue of baseless conspiracy theories? We took, a, a, I think, more of a wider look at it um, and tried to, in the round table, think of ways to get around uh, some of the more, I think, uh, limiting technological or bureaucratic limit, uh, you know, aspects of it um, and think more clearly about how this could be 
um, an issue rooted in civic and public uh, public service. I think the this idea of what beliefs you target and how you target them then sort of threaded into this idea of white supremacy, which came up a few times in in the um, roundtable and almost perhaps interchangeably used with the word white nationalism and then mm. the, and the phrase racism. And they have different connotations and I think perhaps a different transatlantic view. And I was thinking whether from our perspective in the UK, we tend not to talk about white supremacy. We have racism and white nationalism certainly as issues, but we think we label it differently. And I tried to look at that a bit more um, in particular, the way that we deal with some of these sorts of issues that came up in the 6th of January uh, disorder is um, what we do about these groups. And under the UK regime, then groups that have present a terrorist threat can be prescribed by the Home Secretary. And currently there's a list of 77 groups which are prescribed and there are further 14 relating back to Northern Ireland. And of those 77, four, if you read the descriptions on the Home Office site, relate to white supremacy, two specifically referring back to the United States, one um, British one which is described as neo-Nazi, and a fourth which is a, which is a splinter of that. And the, the thing that comes up with those is partly anti-Semitism, because they all have neo-Nazi names. But there's a slightly different connotation, I think. In Britain, and to, to put this very broadly, slavery was something that happened somewhere else in that slavery in Britain was commonly thought not to exist after something like the 12th century. There are different views on this and different people take the view of how you define slavery. But if you define it narrowly and legally, then there was a famous case in the 1770s which said that there is no law of slavery it's unknown to the common law in Britain. Although at that stage, it was apparently thought there were about 10 to 15,000 slaves in Britain who'd been brought here by their masters, owners from abroad. But slavery was something that happened in the colonies or in the United States. And so I wonder whether there is a difference and we have a different perspective that for the United States, white supremacy leads back to slavery as and anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism in a way that's different from the European experience? Um, it's a really fascinating question because in part of the prep that we did for the round table, we looked into um, that great Viva question you laid out at the beginning, the transferability of the research. Um, and what we found is not only that the QAnon movement is being espoused in other countries, that's, um, that's not news, but also that um, various white nationalist organizations around the world were peddling more US focused conspiracy theories in order to kind of play up a version of um, white supremacy or white nationalism. And I also looked into this too in the prep of kind of how do you distinguish the two. Um, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that scholars seem to separate them as, you know, white supremacy being the ideology and white nationalism being kind of the, the manifestation of said ideology around national interest. Um, but putting that all aside, the, the, the movements either in, in Ukraine or around the world, specifically we looked into the Azov movement, um, will use language and speak directly to an American audience. And that's really fascinating, right? Is how are they using elements of white supremacy um, in both their language and in their tactics that can speak to an American audience um, from many uh, hundreds of miles away. And I, I think that your question is an important one, but also I think highlights um, how important it is to, to see the global impact of how QAnon's specific um, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and white supremacist ideologies seem to be, um, whether or not they are resonating, seem to be um, more easily utilized by um, other white nationalist organizations globally. And why is that? And it's one that, I, it's a question that I've been thinking about, but 
but it's it's kind of my answer is a bit evasive in the sense that you know as part of our discussion i can't necessarily speak to the roots of of white supremacy um in countries outside of the us I, but i can say that there is a the question of its transferability and its global reach and whether or not there is something unique um, as you rightly point out, is an is an interesting one, but that um, perhaps the the um, transferability in and of itself is going to be what manifests the most real world harm. Um, if you have American white nationalists being trained in other countries in order to more effectively um, ensue political violence, um, it's a it's an interesting but also really troubling. Uh, series of events. It is. And they say in matters of fashion and the like that where America leads, then others will surely follow. So it is it is deeply troubling, I think, that. And it lead, led into, as you were speaking there, about this idea of, of pushing and pulling. Uh, so is the, the United States pulling this in from outside the Ukraine that you mentioned, uh, or um, is somehow it being pushed. And that that was a, th a theory or an idea in this point about democratic representation in that there are, there are now members of Congress who have espoused some of these conspiracy theories. And it led to a, a, a sort of question as to whether are they pulling on the threads of conspiracy so that they get the votes and they get the money, money raising being a big American political activity perhaps more so than where it's controlled in European states um, more, more firmly? Uh, or are they pushing, are people who are conspiracists pushing to have political representation? And I think that's important just to draw a brief UK analogy. Um, I was trying to think of where that would have mattered and perhaps I've been doing some reading research around the partition of Ireland in 1920 and the fact that the Ulster Volunteer Force, an armed group resisting it, who would be committed to resisting the imposition of home rule at that time, had very leading British politicians supporting them, seemed to change, well, definitely change the dynamic. So is the dynamic in the United States changing or being changed on this push and pull idea in the United States? Yeah, I mean, as you know and alluded to, and as we discussed in the round table at length towards the end when we kind of started to really get at what's at stake um, when we say inroads into the American government. We know that Marjorie Taylor Greene um, won a house seat in Georgia and Lauren Boebert claimed a house seat in Colorado in November of 2020, both of whom have um, publicly espoused the QAnon movement. But what, um, what I looked into in the lead up to the round table in order to kind of put it to our panelists was that Green and, and Boebert weren't alone and that they were among at least a dozen uh, Republican candidates who had endorsed or at least given credence uh, to QAnon's belief that um, pr uh, former President Donald Trump was the last line of defense as against a cabal of uh, of Democrats um, who seek power. And this idea that those who would espouse that um, belief would seek um, a, a seat in, in Congress is, is an interesting one because I think it gets at that pull factor that you mentioned, whether or not um, a fringe political movement could even support a sitting president was an interesting one, let alone then drive further um, politicians into office, um, you know, complicates the issue even further. But that what's emerged is um, a political class that, that understands that if they can tap into um, this very resonant uh, belief system or series of conspiracy theories or movement, um, whatever you want to call it, um, that they can amass influence and money, as you very rightly pointed out. Um, in United States politics, the two go hand in hand. Um, but, but I think your question around whether the movement is fueling political participation or political partic participation is fueling 
um, more of the, the representation of the movement is a fascinating and, and complicating one. Um, and you and I have spoken about this around whether or not the movement has um, a right to be represented, right? That, that very core issue of if it represents the beliefs of elements of the American electorate, then should it then in fact have a seat in the house? And the word should here is irrelevant. They do, they, it already does in the sense that they're, they're being represented by the two people we've mentioned. Um, but, but I think that time will tell whether or not um, the politicians who have played into elements of this movement, whether it is, um, you know, completely or in part or even suggestively to say, well, I don't denounce it, I don't, I don't not believe it, whether or not they um, fully will stand up for it into, into the end, kind of, you know, will it, will it actually be something that they intend to see uh, through is a fascinating one and one that usually comes up when um, votes are cast in the house itself. You know, once you get elected in, in, in the end, you see what a politician stands for outside of the money and influence. Um, I mean, both of which play a, a critical role, but whether or not they'll actually cast the vote on certain legislation will be, I think, a key determining factor in whether or not there will be this push and this pull, or at least that's what came up in our round table in the discussion around kind of how, how these um, politicians may or may not find their footing um, around espousing them. And, and it's tough because, you know, we're, we're recapping an event around conversation that's already been had, but I'm, um, you know, doing my best to also just say that it seemed for me uh, in leaving the round table that that's one of the doors that remains, the, you know, the most open in the sense that it's hardest to gauge the degree to which politicians will, you know, in fact, um, espouse the QAnon movement when it matters the most for um, for them to gain more votes or whether they will find a way to um, pull back or water it down, for example. Um, and that was, I think, a more fascinating element of our round table as well, but I will stop right there and see if perhaps we can, I'm glad we got to the third part that we said we wouldn't. So that means we're doing something right, but also that we need to make way for q and I believe. Yes, thank you very much. That was an incredibly effective and, and very engaging summing up and, and further development of key themes that came out of the, the round table. So thank you to both of you. Um, can I ask the audience please to pop their questions into the Q&A box um, and I will then um, see that I can I can sum them up or, um, if they're if, if they're plentiful they're plentiful um, or just read them out. Um, if you, while you're thinking and writing, um, if I could start off the, the, the Q&A session by asking um, Rana and David to maybe reflect on, or one of you or both of you, to, to tell us a little bit more maybe about why you think the QAnon, the way QAnon and similar, um, well, QAnon in particular, operate, does that explain the reach, because it's not just disseminating messages on social media. There is there is more to it, which is also part of what came out of the roundtable. Um, is there anything specific about the way they operate which makes them so effective um, in in spreading the message horizontally, but also influencing um, vertically? I can um, take that first and then David, feel free to jump in afterwards. I'll just say one thing that came up during the round table around the particular success of the QAnon movement is its um, basis and foundation uh, in real users. I think I said that a little bit earlier, but what I'll say now too, is that it comes up in, um, in, in our discussion around social media companies in particular and their capacity to monitor uh, this was a fascinating piece of the roundtable, their capacity to monitor um, the Stop the Steal movement and the degree to which it got away from them based on the fact that real users were espousing it through authentic speech. And so to what degree can you shut down accounts when they're difficult to monitor and the degree to which um, they weren't just um, you know, one singular user um, recruiting others, but that various real users were all individually recruiting others. Uh, so there is a, a bit of network analysis and analysis around kind of how these webs are formed that could probably play a critical role here in answering your question around how the movement in particular has been 
been um, uniquely successful. Uh, but that's just one one of the many ways that it is. And I think it's just that that element of um, adaptability. Uh, you know, the real users mean that if one account is taken down, then there are many others that can continue to spread it in other chat rooms through that kind of cross-pollinated conspiracy theories, but but all through, also through kind of information laundering and mainstream media. Uh, a lot of different things came out in our roundtable, and I think can can fuel even more research into how this movement in particular is uniquely successful. David, did you want to add something? Or I've got two questions sort of lining up, um, but uh, please, uh, if you would like to add something, then please do. I, I saw you've got questions coming in. I really have, I'm, I'm a novice on q and I have nothing to add. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> then let's move over to the to 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 the questions. Um, um, you know, we start at the top. Win um, is a. Hey, he's congratulating both of you to um, on a great session. Um, quick question. David talked about labels. How do or can academics ensure that they remain objective in analysing these types of issues when many of the concepts used in the discussion and debate around them are essentially contestable? Thanks, Win. Um, who would like to go first? Um, Rana, why don't you start off? And then um, I invite David. Sure. I'll speak briefly since I took the last one and it seems better suited to, uh, to David anyway, uh, because he's the, uh, you know, he's our, our Dr. Bicknell, whereas I am still first year potential, okay. maybe we'll see what happens, okay. uh, potentially a doctor one day. Um, uh, academics ensuring objectivity is probably um, at the core of every academics, uh, I think. Uh, hope for success in any good theoretical and issues-based conversation, but I think in the in the discussion and the debate around the, these issues in particular, as you might have noticed even here right now, it becomes an issue um, because even the terminology is debatable, um, especially in online chat rooms. It can get very very nuanced and very I think um, difficult to. To, to monitor the use of your language while trying to remain objective. But then also that language and those labels can be key in, in signaling your support, right? And so there is, there is, I think, for academics, uh, an important onus in ensuring objectivity. But I think oftentimes it's tough to keep track of how constant the movement is adapting with new language. So how certain terms and certain labels will, will signal um, uh, belief in one thing uh, versus the other. But I'll just say that and let David jump in on kind of the, the, the root of your question. Thank you. Uh, I think the political aspect is certainly one in keeping abreast of that from a more academic level. Because I'm, I'm trained as a lawyer, I was a lawyer for many years. Um, I think the, the key I've always thought is to try and define your terms and then to be, to, to make sure that you stick within them. And that requires constant care to go back to how you define them, to use them correctly, and to question yourself and to spend a lot of time thinking about how they're formulated and what they mean. So as Ron says, they may be used in different ways, but then you have to use them in your research. So it's important to define them as closely as you can and then stick to that and try and recognize the differences where they arise. So we talked about, is there a difference between white supremacy and white nationalism? And perhaps there isn't, perhaps there is, but if you want to make the point, then there, there may be, and you just have to drive that distinction through your work. So it, it's not, there's no magic. There's no magic to being a doctor either, Anna. <laughs> One day you are and the, the, the previous day you weren't. So it doesn't bring special insights or anything, just, just a nice title, I think. Um, so Andrea, next question. Does that Thank you very that? much. Um, our next question is from, and I'm taking a risk here um, with the pronunciation of your surname. If I mangle it, I do apologize. I think it may be Simon Nodge, but I'm not sure. Um, the question is, some QAnon beliefs seem to reflect historic anti-Semitic tropes, for example, blood libel, global deep state conspiracy, that were common to fascist or Nazi ideology of the 20th century. Could we view QAnon as descendant of these movements, or is this something new? Now, we've got three minutes to discuss this at the moment. Um, 
So I'll hand over maybe to Rana first, and then David can jump on the back of that. Sure, I can take this from the political and judicial perspective very briefly, but then I think David, if you could talk on the, the legal level, that might be a good uh, division of labor. In the round table, we discussed specifically this. So yes and no. So uh, is, is it a descendant? Absolutely. There are clearly threads here that um, uh, our analysts laid out very well, actually, in, in also being able to kind of highlight not only the elements of the movement that harken back to um, you know, Nazi ideology and fascism, but also how the responses um, are also meeting the same issues and in, in in history is playing a key role in this. Um, in particular, the way the federal government is able to adequately address paramilitary organizations or not is very much rooted in uh, the history of the American law enforcement system, generally speaking. Um, so this is something new in the sense that the tools, the tactics and the strategies, I believe, and, and so did our analysts believe and, and our panelists in the conversation at the round table believe that there is something new here because of the, the spread, not only online, which is obviously I think more one of the more um, clear and, and more um, obvious examples, but, but I think around this idea of a distortion of belief systems around American narratives in particular. Um, if an American military veteran believes that in service of uh, his or her country, it is their oath and duty to protect the country by participating in the events of July 6th. And that is, I think it a thread and an element of it that is new, that was worth um, investigating and that I wish we could have done more of during the round table, but that I think people will continue to do um, when they look through um, different polls that have come out of the military times and, and, and so forth that have in recent years that have highlighted how the, the, the degree to which this has um, infiltrated elements of American society that have historically um, supported civic identity, religious groups, law enforcement, et cetera, the way that they're being utilized uh, to support the movement. Um, David. I think, as you said, that the history plays an important part. Um, and it goes back to a distinction which I avoided at the beginning, which is we make the distinction based on political um, aspects. So the defining characteristic of insurrection is that it is political violence and terrorism is mostly similar. And that political element makes it different, I think. Um, and so the theme that runs through this is it becomes much more difficult when you're looking at political views rather than other things that are not political in the same way. Andrea, I think our time is up. Thank you very much. You too have been model timekeepers. You've made my, my job extremely easy. Thank you very much for what was, I thought, an extremely interesting, very enlightening session. There's, of course, there are a million other questions that we could discuss and, and, and threads that, have con that might run off it. If the audience at the end um, of the, in the last sort of discussion period would like to bring in some of the reflections um, from, the, from this discussion, from, from this part of the panel, please do so. We, we are very happy to, to, to take questions on the whole range of issues that we have discussed um, this morning. But um, it is now my pleasure to hand over to our Strife team and um, allow Maria to introduce, um, Dr. Maria Varaki to introduce their huge effort in bringing together a wi wide variety of perspectives on the challenges to the rule of law. Maria, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for introducing me. Uh, I'm very happy that I'm part of this uh, panel in this research conference. I have to say that, uh, uh, yes, I was part of this uh, effort for the special issue at the Strive blog on current challenges to the rule of law in times of crisis. But unfortunately, while we were completing this process, I got COVID. So I couldn't fully uh, respond to my commitments. And that's why I would say that my role, apart from an initial organization component, was quite limited. Having said that, I would like here to thank and acknowledge very much Dr. 
David Bignall, who stepped in and he wrote the introductory part of the special issue of the Strife Block on the current challenges to the rule of law in times of crisis, and also very much Francisco and Constance for contributing. Francisco, two pieces, and Constance, one piece, and then David, one more piece. So for one more minute, I would like a little bit to introduce you to this special issue. And to tell you that I saw one of the questions uh, before about contestable terms. And I would say that actually the special issue of strife deals with extremely elusive and debatable terms, such as the rule of law and also the term crisis, which has become extremely fashionable, especially within international legal scholars during the last years. So do we experience a backlash, a crisis of the liberal legal order or of the rules-based order as we know it? And as David summarized in his introductory uh, piece, uh, what do we mean about rule of law? Rule of law is really one of the most elusive concepts. Is it rule of law only? Does it focus only on the domestic level? Can we talk about rule of law in the international legal arena? Is that feasible? Uh, many, many uh, philosophers, legal theories, moral philosophers, political theories, they have written about the importance of rule of law, the difference between the rule of law and rule by law. Uh, others, and I can mention here Joseph Ratz, Donald Dworkin, Ronald Dorkin, others have been more critical about the instrumentalization of rule of law, such as um, Sklar, uh, on uh, as a as a as a tool of the liberal of a particular understanding of the liberal legal order and more recently we start talking about what extent we can talk about the thick version or a thin version of rule of law so is rule of law only limited to legality to procedural legality or should rule of law address also issues of thick justice of substantial of, of distributive justice so these are things that we cannot make just like we cannot do justice within uh, within a very limited issue, but I want to say that uh, the four pieces on the Strive blog, they do deal both with the content, but also with the application of the rule of law, but they focus mainly on the international legal um, arena. So we have uh, <clears throat> two pieces written by Francisco, uh, one about uh, the alleged, uh, not alleged at this stage, uh, about a, a report regarding the Australian forces and their involvement in commission of war crime uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we have another uh, paper by David about the new challenges before the International Criminal Court with regard to the, um, to the British, uh, to the investigation of alleged war crimes by UK forces forces in Iraq and the challenges of the new prosecutor who is actually British and he's going to take over very soon. Uh, we have another piece by Francisco who deals with the decision, who deals with the decision of, Prof of uh, President Biden uh, to um, uh, to strike uh, Syria very, very recently, and the um, argumentation uh, the US used for the particular strike, and a very interesting piece by Constance, where she addresses the challenges, the limits of, of, of the pandemic and the new measures on public health with regard and the risk that that raises for civil liberty. Uh, and I would say that all these pieces have a common thread, a thread that goes be beyond um, a legalistic legal analysis, if I can use this term, and they touch upon issues of, of uh, they touch upon moral issues, ethical issues, political and sociological issues. Having said that, I would like now give the floor to Constance and Francisco. We have uh, decided that the four pieces actually can be teamed in the sense that two pieces address what we tend, what we have described like the bending of the norms of the rule of law and the two other pieces will address the breaching of the norms of the rule of law. So Constance will have a, will address first the bending and then Francisco will take over with the breaching. Thank you very much all. Guys, you have the floor, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, um, I'm not sure if my video is working. Uh, oh, yes. All right. Here we go. <laughs> uh, 
All right, hi everyone. Um, so thank you very much, Maria. So um, here uh, I, I'm going to discuss briefly the, the two strife articles that we had that, uh, uh, as Maria mentioned, uh, touch upon the bending of, uh, of this rules-based uh, international order. So uh, both articles were published as along with the rest of the strife series in the last week of May. Um, the first article is America Strikes Again, Some Thoughts on Biden's First Military Airstrike in Syria, in which Francisco Lobo analyzes the normative factors surrounding the February 2021 airstrike on Syrian territory authorized by the Biden administration, drawing on both legal considerations and the wider ethical framework of use ad uh, And then in uh, my article, Peace in the Time of Pandemic 2, A Clash of Rights and Security, uh, I consider the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and accompanying state securitization on uh, the state of human rights and social cohesion and res resilience. Um, so in Francisco's article, he uses an analysis of the legality and moral dimensions of US airstrikes in Syria to consider the normative framework of use ad vim or a just use of force. So whereas the Trump administration justified their airstrikes in Syria in 2017 and 2018 on humanitarian grounds, the Biden administration's February 2021 airstrikes were justified under self-defense under the UN Charter and the, and the US Constitution. However, while plausibly justified under US domestic law, the legality of the self-defense argument is questionable under international law, as experts argue that the February airstrike rather seemed to be an act of armed reprisal, as it was used with no international mandate to deter future threats. Um, but when moving from legal to normative frameworks, here Francisco argues that the moral dimension of the airstrike should not be ignored. While the US is not formally at war with Syria, so traditional just war theory does not strictly apply, an extension of it, which is Walter's proposed idea of jus ad uh, considers the grounds in which the use of force short of war may be justified and where international law may be extended to allow for this just use of force and set precedents in customary law to mirror the evolution of our shared ethical judgments. So under use ad vim, the US is responding to aggression and is justified to its right to self-defense as long as this defense meets the use ad bellum criteria, which is the use of force, proportion, uh, proportional use of force, force is last resort, authorized by legitimate authority and carried out with the right intent, and that it will reduce the probability of escalation into full-scale war. However, Francisco argues that the airstrikes do not necessarily meet that de-escalation criteria because they run the risk of escalating hostilities in Syria and creating at minimum a proxy war between the US, uh, Russia and their allies. As Francisco eloquently argues, by using the legal view as a departure point for further moral discussion, the interplay between all these standards offers the potential to strengthen our convictions and hone our judgments about the use of force in war. Moving on to my article, um, I use as a basis the well-established tension between a foundational protection for human rights versus security priorities that are at the center of the social contract between state and citizen. The pandemic has had prompt, profound impact on societies by intensifying this clash of rights and securities. Uh, states of emergency or some kind of measures affecting the exercise of fundamental human rights, including freedom of movement, assembly, expression, privacy, or increased militarization and policing have been applied at a global level. Well, of course, the pandemic requires that some restrictions be enacted to protect human health and security, manage public health resources and capacity, and mitigate the overall risk and potential damage of this pandemic. Many states have taken this much farther, raising a significant risk that states might permanently adopt these emergency powers and increase, increase securitization, as they offer states with tempting shortcuts and may lead to a pandemic of human rights abuses, according to Antonio Guterres. Already, the pandemic has had a great impact on gender equality, and with women leaving the workforce in droves relative to men due to lack of support for childcare, as well as, well as increased domestic violence against women and girls. An extreme impact on income inequality and poverty, with fewer resources and economic opportunities available within living rising, rising living costs, and with a very small number of countries monopolizing nearly all vaccines, in turn could prolong both the pandemic and economic recovery. In addition, the pandemic has been used to crush dissent, to criminalize freedoms and silence reporting, and to detain and prosecute any individuals that may criticize governmental responses to the pandemic. And in turn, there's been a striking rise in resistance movements across the world during this period, including protests around key fundamental political and social issues that are erupting within the context of restriction of rights, including the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, 
pro-democracy uh, protests in Hong Kong, farmer protests in India, protests against violence against women and sexual, sexual assault in Spain, Chile, and the UK. Lebanon's protests responded to compounding crisis, the popular struggle against the military coup in Myanmar, and protests against political instability in Peru, to name a few. Across the world, these have a key characteristic in common, which is resistance against violence, abuse of power, and suppression of freedoms. If a more rights-based rights balance is not struck in such clashes of rights and security, the foundations of our societies are at risk. As populists and others, as Rana and David pointed out, uh, can capitalize on the social fragmentation resulting from socio-political issues and inequality. So in the face of an ex expected global economic downturn and the real possibility of new and deadlier pandemics ahead, if a global environmental and economic factors are not addressed, there can be an aggravation of the factors that were feeding discontents before the pandemic, risking both continued repression and resistance. I argue that we should perhaps prepare for renegotiation of our state society relations and reconsider how citizens relate to each other in order to not cause lasting damage to the foundations of our societies or cause a slide back to greater repression in places where any gains and rights have been fraught and hard won. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, my presentation, and uh, that's handing off to Francisco. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the video to start. Um, I'm sure it's working. I think the host needs to turn it on, my video feed. Start my video, okay. Okay, <laughs> hello, thank you. Uh, thank you, Constance. That was a very, very generous preview. I think uh, as, as usual, the preview or the trailer is even better than the movie. So, uh, but do go and, and read the, all, the, all the pieces, of course, I, I suggest that. And yes, um, I will be very brief right now because I think we're all eager to going back to the Q&A and the discussion. So um, uh, after Constance referred to bending the rules and what happens with uh, bending human rights standards and uh, maybe the standards on the use of force uh, in international relations, I will refer to what happens when we break the rules, when there is a breach of the rules, specifically the rules governing the conduction of hostilities uh, during armed conflict. Uh, those breaches are referred to as war crimes uh, in, in international law. And... Um, the last two pieces of our series refer to war crimes. Uh, the first one uh, focuses on the Burton report. This report that was published last year in Australia uh, concerning uh, very disturbing and shocking allegations of war crimes committed by Australian special, special forces in Afghanistan. Um, Australia has appointed a special prosecutor to deal with this matter uh, internally, domestically, uh, back there in, in, under, under Australian law. But um, what, what struck me as uh, very interesting in the report when I was reading it and what inspired me to put pen to paper on this subject was that the report is adamant that uh, in that uh, there will be no need whatsoever for the International Criminal Court to intervene. Uh, it even states that the court lacks jurisdiction, which is technically not true. Um, uh, Australia is a party to the Rome Statute, same as Afghanistan. And if the, according to the principle of complementarity that uh, states that if a state fails to prosecute a, a crime uh, that, that uh, is, is uh, criminalized in the, in the Rome Statute, uh, because it's either unwilling or unable to prosecute the crime, then the International Criminal Court must step in. Uh, according to an admissibility uh, examination, of course, but um, the possibility is still there. And I, I think that the Burton report is, is a little defensive uh, in that regard. And um, we will have to wait and see how the, the Australian judiciary behaves and addresses this issue. And then we'll see if the principle of complementarity operates or not, and if the ICC has to intervene or step in or not. Uh, but that's not a matter for Australians. 
uh, alone to decide because uh, the thrust of my argument is that they were in, in Afghanistan in the first place on our behalf, on behalf of the, of the international community, uh, fulfilling a mandate by the UN Security Council. So uh, it's not only an internal affair, it's, it's an international issue. So uh, we, we will have to, to keep an eye on that. And, and then we move on to, to David Vignell's uh, opinion on, on the ICC more generally, or more, more in the abstract, but uh, with very practical applications, because uh, his column is, is titled Prosecuting War Crimes, Some Thoughts for the New Prosecutor of the ICC. As Maria said, the new prosecutor, Karim Khan, will begin his term next week. Uh, and, and David Bignell has some thoughts for him uh, to, to maybe uh, help him do his job a little better, hopefully. Uh, and basically what David Bignell uh, thinks uh, is that um, after some very controversial decisions, recent decisions uh, at the ICC, the, the, well, the prosecutor's decision not to uh, investigate further um, war crime allegations by British forces in Afghanistan first, I'm sorry, in Iraq first, uh, and secondly, the, the pre-trial chamber decisions to um, authorize an investigation into alleged war crimes in the Palestinian territories, that was this year. Um, after those controversial decisions, uh, David Bignall believes that uh, some clarification uh, concerning the work of the Office of the Prosecutor is needed, uh, specifically regarding some conceptual uh, gaps or, or uncertainties that, that are present in the Rome statute. So I don't want to get overly technical because we don't, we don't have enough time, but um, basically the threshold for the International Criminal Court to intervene to prosecute war crimes is uh, rather high. Uh, the, the crimes must be a part of a plan or policy or large, large scale uh, pattern. Um, but, but that's not uh, sufficiently defined at the, at the level of the Rome Statute and the, and the Office of the Prosecutor usually ignores that, that requirement. So that is something that needs more clarification on the one hand. And the second issue that David addresses is, well, uh, the, the investigation is actually a, a three stage process. Uh, first, there is a preliminary examination by the prosecutor. Then we move on to the, an investigation. Uh, and finally, we can charge someone with a, with a crime uh, before the court. So uh, for the first stage, there is a standard of uh, that there is, uh, the, the, the belief that there is a, a reasonable basis uh, to lead to an investigation. Uh, then when we move to the second stage of the investigation, the standard changes, and then we're talking about a realistic prospect of conviction. And finally, we can move to the, to the third stage of charging someone with a crime. Um, and David believes that uh, all these standards are also kind of blurry, and uh, the, we need more, more uh, clarity around these, these uh, concepts for the prosecutor to do a better job, more coherent, uh, consistent job vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis all these atrocities that that can be prosecuted by the by the International Criminal Court when when the rules not only are are bent but are also breached and that is the the core of the argument of, of David's opinion. So I'll just uh, leave it there. Uh, back to you, Maria, and I'm looking forward to the to the Q and A. Thanks. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, both of you, for summarizing so meticulously uh, the four articles. And I want to congratulate all of you, including David, of course, who is with us, uh, for contributing these four pieces and for David once more, you know, for contributing also the introductory uh, piece. I, I, I don't think I have anything else to say. I give the floor back to Andrea for uh, for to continue, you know, the, the moderation of this panel. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much for your very succinct summarizing of, um, of, of the Strife blog series. And thank you, Maria, for introducing it so um, expertly. Um, we already have questions. Um, one is, is sort of going back to QAnon. I will, I will raise that, that question later, but the, the, the one, the second one um, speaks particularly to Constance's paper. Um, it is an anonymous attendee who asked, it's one matter for states to institute lockdowns, quite another to institute curfews, as in Holland and France, which is very concerning. Far worse are prosecutions by the Indian government for any criticism of COVID policy, which, which is unconscionable, surely. 
should be criticized by World Health Assembly. Now, there are a whole host of issues in this um, sort of all wrapped up together. Constance, would you like to start unraveling them? And if anyone else on the panel would like to, or for that matter, um, David or Rana would like to also speak to this, please do. Um, Constance, you go ahead, please. Certainly. Uh, so that, that that's a, these are very good examples um, of, uh, of what we're talking about uh, uh, here. What, what what I what I argue uh, in the paper, um, the curfews, for example, there is no evidence, uh, as far as we know, that the curfews in particular uh, work, uh, as opposed to to lockdown, which I agree is a, is a different question, um, and indeed. Uh, uh, there, there are numerous examples of then these kind of repressive measures, including um, the, the, the detainments uh, and, uh, and prosecution of anyone uh, from activists to, to even medical professionals um, that have been criticizing in any way uh, government policies and, and approaches to COVID and responses to COVID. Um, uh, uh, there, are, yeah, there are instances of, of, of this in in, uh, in many places, and this should be alarming. And I guess this speaks to to the question that I I would have <laughs> for myself, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, what what is the correct balance to strike? I can't pretend to have all the answers here, but um, uh, upon some reflection uh, on my side, I think that. Um, there are three factors uh, that that play with these issues that play on these issues um, uh, that are intentionality, timing, and permissiveness. Um, intentionality: it's that states need to ensure that any res restrictions that they create, any any measures that they enact, um, have to have a reason. Um, they have to have a clear justification um, uh, as a clear response to the conditions, to to um, uh, to the uh, the risks to human health and security that are and and uh, public health capacity that are raised by the by the pandemic. Um, so they need a clear justification in, in terms of timing also, uh, and that's been a great problem because we haven't had a very clear view um, uh, and consistent understanding of what exactly the pandemic is and you know what's contagious, or what's wh what exactly the real uh, threats are and what the clear information is, um, but. A kind of consequence of that is that um, uh, there's been no end date. Often, you have had these measures put in place, and there's no there's no clear communication as to when they're going to end. Um, which then goes into the you know these, 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 this question of uh, um, of the risk of these becoming permanent states of emergency. Uh, as if I can extrapolate a little bit, as we have seen uh, with uh, with the war on terror in uh, in certain countries, where you know it has become an infinite war, and um, yeah, and then I guess in, in, in my permissiveness point, um, I think states have a responsibility that because you have so much resistance um, uh, in terms of uh, political and social movements at this point uh, uh, that are raising very real, very important issues for societies. Um, it is the responsibility of the state to also find a way to allow this protest to happen in safe ways. And we know that there are ways that protests can be handled, uh, uh, carried out with, uh, with you know, degrees of social distancing and organization, um, but still be, uh, still be visible. Um, that's, my <laughs> that's my answer. Uh, I hope that, that helps or that's clear. Sorry. Um, I thought I had unmuted myself. Um, thank you very much, Constance. Yes, that 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 has answered a lot of the questions. Um, just one so small footnote observation on the side. Um, it's quite interesting to see different countries, even just in Europe, not even globally, um, to see them institute or put in place different sunset clauses um, for different types of, of emergency legislation. Um, in other words, when do these these um, new measures or the temporary measures need to be reviewed um, and and reviewed for further approval? And some countries um, have have introduced different gradations of which measures need sooner to be re re reviewed more more quickly and more frequently than other measures. And other countries have just given where the governments have given themselves quite a lot of scope for for extended um, powers for quite a long period of time as well. 
So, so there is a lot to probe as to the democratic culture um, above ground to reference um, Rana's brand table. And, and then that might play into the um, resistance movements um, that, that you talked about constant as well as, as, as with regard to their empowerment or not and, and may fuel if there are you know, too few sunset clauses or the reviews are not going that well, then um, it might fuel resistance movements. But I see Maria's hand is up. In, um, so I will hand over to Maria. Yes, thank you for that. I, I saw also that there are some questions for Anna, but later, I, I don't know, Andrea, I don't want to step in, you know. Is it okay? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I, it's, it's a question that it is actually addressed to all of you, to Constance, Francisco and David about your pieces in the blog. And from what I realized, reading your, your, your pieces, there is, as I say, a common thread where all of you acknowledge the limits of the rules-based international legal order, or maybe I'm wrong, you know, you, you, can, you can totally contest me about that, because you all bring another element apart from the law, whether it's the socio-political context or the ethical, very strong ethical moral context, especially in Francisco pieces, the socio-political inconstance, the social contract idea, you know, but also David's piece where he needs, you know, we talk about further clarification about criteria, further clarification of prosecutorial policies. So I was wondering, you know, how do you think about these limits, you know, of this? Of course, we all totally talk, we already talk about bending and breaking, you know, but I, I was wondering, you know, how you, you deal with that in your own pieces, in your own research. Thank you. May I go? Okay. Um, yes. Well, the, the piece about uh, the use of force in Syrian territory, the first drone strike by Biden, uh, I, I thought, well, it's, it's, it's almost a pattern by now. The U.S. Uh, strikes a country or uses force. It's considered illegal by the international community and by uh, international lawyers in particular. They publish their pieces and then, and then that's that. And then the, the cycle continues. And, and usually my, my colleagues in the legal profession and, and international scholars, international legal scholars, they, they are satisfied with that analysis. And, and they keep saying the US is breaching the rules, breaching the rules, and uh, there's state responsibility uh, associated with that. And, and that's that. But they, they don't usually go beyond the, the legal analysis and they don't engage with other disciplines. Uh, uh, and, and, and I'm talking about uh, similar disciplines like ethics, morals, uh, the just war tradition. So I, I think it's, uh, and this, this goes back to, the, to some of the, one of the questions to, to David and Rana, what can scholars do? What can uh, uh, doctrinal works do to address all these issues? I think we need to engage with more disciplines. I, I think we, we need to, to take a multidisciplinary approach to, to these issues. It's not enough to say that the rules are being breached. And, and that's too bad and, and there need to be legal consequences. Of course, I believe in that, but there's uh, so much more to say about uh, breaking the rules. Why are they being uh, broken? And why, why I, uh, issues of legitimacy underlying the rules are also at stake here. And that goes back to, to the first part of this panel. Uh, there is a crisis of legitimacy uh, back there in the U.S. and that's, that has been projected into the, into the whole rules-based order that the U.S. has championed in the past seven decades. So we need to engage more with other disciplines, I think. Uh, and that goes for everyone. Uh, lawyers need to talk more to political scientists and international relations experts uh, uh, and et cetera. Thank you very much. I have, we have a whole host of questions now. I will take them in slightly reverse order um, because the last one is, I think, best addressed by Francisco. So I'm sorry for stressing you out, Francisco. I'm going to fire another question at you. Simon Notch has, has popped up again. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say he has a very sort of active participant. He enjoys the panels um, and asks the question uh, regarding Australia and the ICC. Um, they ask, Australia seems determined to shirk responsibility for breaches of international norms, especially regarding the treatment, detainment of refugees. What can be done about this? Francisco, over to you. Okay, so yeah, this is this is a different. This is <laughs> I hate to to get all lawyerly with 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 the. The person who asked this, but this this isn't an issue necessarily regarding 
international criminal law, so it's not within the, the purview of the ICC. Uh, it, it doesn't have to do with war crimes uh, because we're talking about refugee uh, conventions. And of course, Australia has uh, international obligations uh, in that field. But, um, but yeah, but you can, you can uh, address those breaches. Uh, you can uh, make effective state responsibility for breaching the rules before other fora. And uh, for instance, if, if you have a, a treaty and, the, and Australia is breaching the treaty, you can uh, then bring Australia before the International Court of Justice, which is an altogether different uh, tribunal uh, to, to the ICC. So, but these are different, they're, they're connected, uh, granted, uh, the, the whole world is in turmoil, of course, but uh, these are different, different legal fields, uh, war crimes on the one hand and international criminal law and uh, refugee law on the other one. Thank you very much. Maria, your hand is up. Is it still up or is it a new up? It's a new, sorry to say, uh, to interrupt briefly about that. It's very interesting, this question, that although it doesn't have to do with war crimes, uh, I mean, there are many, many international legal scholars now that have, they push the criminalization, you know, of migration policies. So there are attempts before the International Criminal Court on the crimes against humanity from regarding migration policies. And it's something, you know, uh, that we have seen that for Australia, but also for Mediterranean countries. So maybe in the future, there will be some interesting developments on this front. So I stop here. Thank you. Thank, uh, Francisco, go ahead. Just to add something very quickly, of course, it could be framed under the, the concept of crimes against humanity, but you would have to, to prove that there is a, a general attack against the, the civilian population, a general or systematic attack against the civilian population. So the threshold is rather high to get to bring this to the ICC. Um, we mustn't forget that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to bundle the next questions. They, they, they are somewhat linked um, and also build a nice bridge from Constance to Rana and maybe David, um, if, he, if he wants to speak to that as well. So we have one question asking, is it not vital that World Health, as in the, World Health the WHO or some agencies prescribe deliberate, de, de, sorry, deliberate medical falsehoods started by Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, Lukashenko in Belarus, Tanzania's ex-president or Modi in India, talking of herbal essences curing lives. These lies, lies have cost lives. How can this be stopped? Now, the lies, the falsehoods, the... Um, um, you know, it's not. It, it, it's also in the U.S. We had President Trump suggesting that um, that drinking bleach might might somehow disinfect people internally, um, which was taken so seriously by bleach manufacturers that they issued um, health warnings and 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 uh, dementies. So um, clearly, this is not just um, a, 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 a non um, global north um, issue. This links to another question, um, the, the falsehoods and the conspiracy theories, et cetera, um, which we had, which is a, a hangover from the, from the first session, which came in later after we've already had moved on. Whether there are any studies that have been done who joins, um, who, who these uh, QAnon believers are, whether they come from certain groups, are they disgruntled, ill-educated persons, or are they in fact, um, reasonably well-off people who have, um, that I would add this, um, are they reasonably well-off people who feel that they have been forgotten by um, the waves of globalization, feel disenfranchised? And that then finally links to a question that's come in via YouTube. Um, the person is interested to know, I don't know who asked the question, um, why people think Trump represented a true white supremacist trend in politics. This idea of him as the leader of this ideational trend seems peculiar. So Constance, would you like to start off? Certainly, and I, I do actually, I completely agree with you, Andrea, that uh, the, the links to, uh, to, to Rana's work is, uh, are very clear here. Um, because what, what we're ultimately talking about um, is how do you how do you stop the spread of, of misinformation? Uh, whether that misinformation has to do with um, uh, with health, uh, with the pandemic, um, or with uh, with you know the, uh, any of the beliefs of the QAnon supporters. Um, 
for me, there, there are two elements here. Um, and uh, and uh, Rana will speak uh, probably, uh, I hope I'm not putting her on the spot, but um, more uh, <laughs> more eloquently to, to, to the second one. Um, but the first is that, you know, um, uh, there has been a very clear lack of consistency and coherent information that's been coming from, uh, from both uh, international and domestic uh, health agencies because there we haven't known what this is um, or hasn't been very clear what the pandemic was right from the start. Um, and that has led to a great deal of, uh, um, of kind of undermining trust um, in, in these health agencies where there is an expectation that um, they should have known and they should have been able to tell us right from the start. Um, and unfortunately, that's that's you know not how science works. Um, as much as we would like, as much as we would like it to be, and it, it rarely does become a policy issue afterwards because um, you you do have this this moment of uh, how do you maintain public trust when you've been giving um, kind of. Uh, uh, differing information. So it is hard then to also counter some of these outlandish claims coming from uh, from the, these countries that you've listed and others about what it is because there has been this lack of consistency. But um, I think that the second point is, um, is also, how do you stop this via social media? Because uh, social media has been a huge uh, source of, of, uh, of spreading these falsehoods and, and this misinformation. Um, uh, and it's uh, unchecked. And unfortunately, people, to everybody checks social media more than they check, you know, the latest announcement from the, from the WHO. So um, that's, uh, that's one of the big ch policy challenges, I would say, of, of our time. Um, and so I'll, I'll hand off to, to Rana here. If I could just, while Rana is unmuting herself, jump in briefly, it, it's also a matter of looking at what the WHO's remit is and how they work. And one of the key working principles that may need to be challenged now is of, of the WHO is, and the IAE, the International Atomic Energy Agency has a similar approach, is not to hang any country out to dry. They are dependent on countries cooperating with them. Therefore, the idea that the WHO would, um, to put it colloquially, dish dirt on any of its members, um, they're underfunded anyway. They have trouble getting everyone really together and, and, and responding in a timely and, and sufficiently at scale manner. They are unlikely to, to, to be too super critical. So there, there is that underlying tension, which may actually require review particularly if we're facing a greater range of pandemics, but that is a serious consideration which, which curbs their ability to, to intervene. But I do apologize, Rana, I'm sure you are now totally unmuted. I will now mute myself. Um, thank you. Yes, I think that uh, the, the issue around uh, COVID-related disinformation and conspiracy theories certainly uh, converges in a really, I think, um, serious, damaging way to the health of, of Americans and to the detriment to, of uh, um, American public health institutions. But at the same time, um, what came up in our round table was this issue of conspiracy convergence, where you go looking for information about one thing and find um, conspiracy related information on another. And you, that's how you kind of get pulled down these various rabbit holes, um, or at least that's what far better experts around issues of, of conspiracy theories have highlighted as some of these um, pathways to conspiracy theories for users um, who seek to find them. So there's a fascinating um, exploration by, uh, by various organizations and think tanks into kind of how these networks collide um, and particularly around uh, disinformation or misinformation related to, to public health, but in particular, with re regards to this, this disinformation that purposefully misleads people, you'll enter a chat room to, to find information about, say, for example, the election or, um, or the, the, the Stop the Steal movement, but instead find information about COVID and the vaccine. And perhaps those, those, those um, threads come together, or there's a, an opportunity there for those um, 
conspiracies to converge, which is a, is a fascinating development within kind of this understanding that we're slowly, I think, starting to not only develop, but then also crystallize insofar as it, it feeds into solutions based approaches into how to mitigate the threat. Uh, but it's a very big question um, and, and one that we certainly don't have the answers to yet, but that will, I think, prove crucial to not only the success of, of combating COVID, but also ensuring that um, Americans are able to engage in a dialogue on public health without feeling as though they have to entrench themselves into some sort of uh, political ideology to do so. Thank you, Rana. Would you like to take up the um, the other question about why? So, questioner asks, why do people think Trump represented a true white supremacist trend in politics? Um, this idea of him as the leader of this ideational trend seems peculiar. Would you like to sort of engage with that briefly? We are rapidly running out of time, so you have about. Um, uh, happily, five seconds. I think that. In the absence of a, of a one true leader, I think you often look to the most visible, uh, but I think that it's peculiar because the questioner points out the very right issue uh, and, and, and very accurate uh, dichotomy here between the most visible and the longevity of these issues. Uh, so whether or not the visibility of Trump is uh, a more recent manifestation, the longevity of white supremacy and the ravages that it's had on the American political system long predate him and, and the, the manifestations of political violence are rooted in American history in a way that is not in any way a stand in for that. But, um, but I would only say that it's, uh, it's less about kind of, I think, finding a leader, but also being able to, to address the issue we raised earlier that if real users are believing this, spreading this and recruiting others, um, trying to attribute Trump as a leader, if, if that's being interpreted in any capacity, uh, is also, I think, trying to pull people off the scent, which is, uh, you know, important. Uh, uh, it's important to acknowledge, you know, the degree to which it's, it's disparate and yet unified. Uh, and so in any way to kind of attribute it to one singular political leader would I think be uh, misleading not only for the law enforcement officials who are seeking to bring people to justice, but also the Americans who are seeking to understand how this is uh, salient and, and translating across regions, across states um, and into the very fabric of, of local county sheriff's offices and, and community organizations organizations, uh, there is no singular leader, but uh, to say so is also to kind of, I think, avoid and ignore the, the root of the issue. Thank you very much, Rana. Um, there was a question earlier about research on QAnon. I, I, I am aware of the, for example, the Pew Research Center having done some research into, into the role of QAnon and how it's perceived and received and, and, and who, who um, joins in. Unfortunately, we are now super out of time. We are we at 11.30. This is the, the end of our session. We haven't been able to answer all the questions if our panelists are so inclined and can still see the questions after the session has been completed, um, then please do engage. Um, there are some interesting further questions that, that we unfortunately are, are unable to address. So I just would like to thank but both our audience for asking super questions and really developing some of the themes that, that we addressed and our panel addressed um, um, further. Um, and then to finally thank our panel members, um, everyone for their sterling work for this entire year and pulling it all together and really doing themselves, I think, great justice in presenting the, 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 the major team effort and individual efforts that you've made in the course of this year. So thank you very much. I think you can all be proud of yourself and uh, now go into the sort of slightly sort of more calmer period of life <laughs> with a high degree of satisfaction. Thank you very much and take good care. And the same of course goes to the audience. Take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>